English, the solution for humanity. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today's subject is why fix what is perfect. You know, many times we, uh, as children or young people, we find a machine, we find a mechanism, maybe we get given a remote control car or we get something that we've been given new. And what is the first thing we do? We get a screwdriver and we try to open it and figure out how it was all put together. But some of us, if you're like me, are very good at taking things apart, but not very good at putting things back together again. And so it can be quite confusing. Luckily, the women are not as bad as us, and they don't do things like that. They know how to cook things and burn things and experiment that way, but they never really take things apart. It's like our male thing. It's the thing that men like to do. We like to find something new and take it apart and figure out how it all works and then somehow try to figure out how to put it all back together again. But most times, we're not very successful at that. So today, why fix what is perfect? The religion of Islam is perfect. And today we have many people who are trying to fix it. They say we need to modernize, or we need to move with the times, or we need to find a way that we can reach the young people. And so what we do is we have discos. We have Muslim discos. I often on my Facebook, and yes, I have a Facebook page and I get invited to discos, Muslim discos and Muslim parties and Muslim raves. And I don't see how we can try to get people to become Muslims if we're lowering our level and saying, well, this is the way you can become a Muslim. We'll come down to your level and we'll sit down there with you. You know, today there are many people who, who think that somehow we can fix religion or fix Islam by lowering our standards. That's not how we're going to fix it. That's how we're going to ruin it. If we looked at all religions in the world or any belief system in the world that has failed, you'll see that the way they have failed is by modernizing. And that is one thing that Islam does not need. It does not need to be watered down. It does not need to be modernized. It is already modern enough as it is. One of the beautiful things about Islam is that it is so up-to-date. I have often said that if you open the very, very first chapter of the Quran, that you'll find that the idea of how to create a Facebook or how to create a homepage is there on the very first chapter of the Quran. If you open up to Quran chapter, the first chapter of Surah Al-Fatiha that all Muslims must learn by heart, just like if you're a Christian you're watching this, uh, Surah Al-Fatiha is like the Our Father. We have to learn this by heart because it means so much to us. But the beautiful thing about Surah Al-Fatiha, it's the Quran's homepage. When you see this first chapter, it's only seven verses long. It tells you everything that you need to know about the rest of the pages that are going to come. It tells you everything that you'll find in the rest of the Quran. And what is beautiful about it is it's put in order. It has a structure. Who is it written for? Why was it written? Who is going to benefit from this? So it's a beautiful uh, chapter. But we'll see that in Islam, many things are there that are under attack today, and people want to modernize or want to change things. But we as Muslims must make sure that this doesn't happen. We must be happy with the way our religion is. So why fix what is perfect? It is perfect. It does not need to be changed. However, we do need to send our own lives, our lives, in for repairs every now and then. Now, any of you who have a motor car know that every few hundred kilometers or maybe a uh, uh, after every 20,000, you have to go and you have to send it in for a checkup. And what happens at the checkup? They check the oil, they check the gaskets, or what, I don't know anything about cars, so I'm just guessing this is what they do. I get a bull, but I don't know what they did to the car. And what they do is they check your car and they send back, and they sign a little piece of paper and they put it into your logbook. And why do you have to have that in your logbook? Because it helps with the resale value of the car. If you do not send your vehicle into the reputable company to have it signed and have the stamp by the dealership, you don't get as much money for it later. But if you have all those stamps in the right place, you get the right price for your car when you want to sell it, an up-to-date price. And so what we do is we have that continual checkup. And so as Muslims, we need that continual checkup. And we get that checkup. We don't wait for 100,000 kilometers or 10,000 kilometers to get that checkup. We get that checkup every Ramadan. Every Ramadan, we go and we 
go to a local masjid or mosque or whatever you want to call it, and we go there and we spend time for those 30 or 29 odd days and we have our checkup. This is when we change and make sure that we're on the right path. We make sure that we're doing everything right. But we do not modernize. We don't go and we say, well, listen, I will go on the first two days and then I'll see you for the last week. See, some people do that. They think, well, I get the benefits from the last week or so, last 10 days, but I'll go there for the first two days just so that my parents know that I've been there. Or maybe you go there just to keep your wife off your back. Or maybe the wife goes to a community thing and so you go off to a mosque purely because there's nothing else for you to do at home because of uh, the beginning of Ramadan. No, this is not why we do it. We do it, we do, it's all or nothing in Ramadan. We must do it all. So don't give just the last 10 days. You must go for the whole 100%. You want to have a proper, you want to have the dealership stamp at the end of it. So we need to do what is right. We need to aim for perfection. We need to aim for what is right. The next thing that we need to understand when we're looking at um, our religion of perfection, we're not, uh, why fix what is perfect is, we need to become an addict. Now in life, we are addicted to many things. You know, people are addicted to drugs. People are addicted to alcohol. People are addicted to pornography. People are addicted to sport. People are addicted to many, many different things. But now, how do we get away from addictions? We get away from addictions by replacing them with another addiction. This is the only addiction that you don't need to replace it with anything, and that is being addicted to Islam. We need to learn to become so addicted to Islam that people go and they say to him, you know, this guy is overboard, he's addicted, you know, I don't know what's wrong with this guy, he's so addicted. That is the best compliment you can ever receive. If somebody says you're an addict to Islam, that's the best compliment you can receive. In fact, if they don't call you an addict to Islam, you need to start worrying and maybe you need to start trying to find a way to get addicted to it. Now, I meet people that are addicted for, to many, many different things. Uh, in my work as a, a chaplain, um, I meet people who are addicted to alcohol, I meet people who are addicted to drugs. I meet people that are addicted to cell phones, to chat rooms, to MS and SMS and all these other things. But I hardly ever come across in any of the work that I do somebody who's addicted to Islam. And that's a sad, sad day when you come across people and there's 1.4 billion Muslims in the world and we can't find people that are addicted to Islam. Now I have before me here a, a little kit here. It's called a drug detective kit. And I'm going to open it up to you and I'm going to show you what's in it. So all young people, you better start worrying because your parents are going to get hands on this pretty soon. And this little kit here, uh, I don't know if it's going to be available in any country in, in the world other than South Africa. But what it has here, it has a little swab. And what your parents can do, or you can do because you're such a good person, you don't touch drugs, is they can go to the keyboard of your computer up to five days after somebody has been suspected of using drugs. And they can wipe this little swab on your keyboard and they put it into this little bottle and it'll tell them what drug you took and how much of that drug you took up to five days ago. So they can test for your addiction with a little testing kit which will be in your home. Now they can test it on your clothing. They can test it on any glass that you touch in your house. They can test it by just wiping it on any part of your body or on the keyboard of your computer. Anywhere that you've been up to five days ago, they can test it. They can see how addicted you are and what addiction you're on, just with a simple test. Now, why have I got this here? Because I use it myself. Um, I have people that are, I deal with a rehab clinic in my home where I invite three people maximum at a time and I help them and I rehabilitate them who have addiction to drug or alcohol. But what I found is that I can test for the addiction. With this test, testing kit, I can see. But with Islam, it's very difficult to test our addiction levels. And so many people... What they want to do, they want to do external things to prove how addicted they are or to prove how, how Muslim they are. You cannot test somebody's addiction level by what they do on the outside. You can only test somebody's addiction level by wiping a swab across them and seeing how addicted they are. Just like with a drug test, there's no way of seeing it from the outside. I've heard many great stars, many cricket players, soccer players, rugby players, football players, who have later, after their careers have ended, have admitted that they took drugs while they were in the high, uh, when they were at one of the biggest games of all time. So people don't know this. They cannot see it from the outside. That's how good drugs can be. So what we need to do when we become an addict, the only way we can tell is to do introspection. So why fix what is perfect? We need to have a look at the outside and the inside. We need to have a look and see what we are doing, what we are saying, what we are doing, what our actions are saying, what our internal belief is. Because we can fool some people some of the times, most people most of the time, but ourselves none of the time.
So we need to do uh, internal uh, audit. We need to make sure that we become addicted. Addicted means you cannot do without it, and you're not going to be able to stop it no matter what people try to do. You'll always do it. Now, the other th point I'd like to talk about is choosing a diamond. Now, any of you have a, a wife maybe at home, you, she wanted a diamond ring, uh, you bought her a diamond ring. Uh, I remember my mother, she said the only thing she ever wanted in life was a diamond ring, and uh, she never got the diamond ring. But anyway, some people, that's their dream, to have a diamond ring. But she got everything else. She got a loving family, she got children, she had a home, she had everything, but she never got that diamond ring. I don't know why she never got the diamond ring. But the diamond is what we have as Islam to offer people, and it is perfect. You know a diamond is perfect. Yes, there are slight flaws in it, and there are different carrots that you have. They call them carrots. Different clarity of diamonds that you have, but diamonds are amazing. One is they are super, super strong. They are beautiful to look at. And they, when they are cut into the right way and cut in the right shape, they reflect light in such a beautiful way as well. They're absolutely stunning to look at. No matter what you might think of wealth and material gains in life, a diamond is one thing that all of us agree is beautiful. Even if you don't want one, maybe you don't want one because it's expensive and you don't want to say that you want one because then it's going to cost money and, and the, the money's going to have to come from somewhere. But a diamond is an amazing thing and, and even I have a diamond at home. And uh, I have it because I, I just find it such a beautiful stone to be able to talk about. Many times when I do talks, those of you who have seen me on, uh, on television before or seen me in talks, I always have a prop. I always bring something to show you so that you'll remember the talk by it. But a diamond is amazing because if you show somebody a diamond, he always wants it. If I have a piece of coal in this hand, he never wants the coal because he can get the coal anywhere and it's cheap and it's easy to get hold of. But this is often the difference between... Uh, Islam and other religions. You see, often when we speak about other religions, we want to complain about the coal that they have. And we say the coal is rubbish, and we tell them how ugly the coal is, but we don't show them how beautiful the diamond is. What we need to do is we need to concentrate on the beauty of the diamond, and we have to say, this is what you want. This is where you need to be. Don't tell them how ugly the coal is. They already know how ugly the coal is. Show them the beauty of the diamond, and they'll by themselves drop the coal and want to take the diamond. This is Islam. Islam is very practical. It's showing the people how, how beautiful our religion is, how easy it is to come over to Islam. But a diamond also is perfect, and we do not want to fix a diamond. We don't take the diamond in for repairs and say, listen, this diamond, there's a problem with it. It shines too much. Or this diamond, it's way too strong. Or this diamond, it's way too clear. We don't want to change what is perfect. That's how we should be. We should have it the way the diamond is. Perfect, it should be clear. It should be the way that we have it at home. If you have a diamond, you look at it and you look after it, you wash it, you clean it, but it is perfect. So why fix what is perfect? The next thing we need to do is we need to make sure that our building that we build in our life is built with the correct foundations. Now we're going to take a break and when we get back from the break, I'm going to talk why do we have to build a building with the correct foundations. References. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na the illallah. That we believe in only one only Almighty God. One. Dr. Zakir Naik. The common Hindu says that everything is God. We Muslims say everything is God's. G O D with an apostrophe. S. Relationships reinforced. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe, S, the Hindus and the Muslims Hindus will be united. Dr. Zakir highlights the vital common teachings of Hinduism and Islam to bring Hindus and Muslims together in similarities between Hinduism and Islam in Truth Exposed starting from this Thursday at 9 p.m. and repeat telecast at 7.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. We are talking about why we should fix what is perfect. 
Our religion of Islam is perfect. It does not need fixing. It does not need anything else to add it on to it. And we're looking at some examples so that you can take these examples and apply them to your day-to-day -day life. So what we've seen is already is that you need to become addicted. You need to choose the diamond. And now we're looking at the third point is that we need to build with foundations. In other words, do you have a building that has no foundations? If you have a building that has no foundations, the first time a little bit of wind comes along, a bit of too much rain comes along, a bit of storm or whatever, that building will start to shake. And then what will happen? It will come collapsing down and there's nothing that will be able to put that building back together the way it was again, unless you start from the beginning again. Foundations is so important. We need to make sure our foundations are right. Foundations, and you know, sometimes we just say the five pillars of Islam, um, we look at the six uh, parts of our faith, you know, that is not all. We need to do more. We need, those are the basics of our foundation. We need to add more to it. And I have done a, a talk uh, in depth about this and how to build your foundations properly. If you want to find out more about it, go look at uh, Peace TV on the, on the website, and you'll be able to find more out on that topic. But foundations are so important. It's the most important thing that we need to, to get right after we've taken the Shahada, get our foundations right. If your foundations are not built properly, you'll fall for anything and it will collapse. Get your foundations right. Make sure that you're doing your Salah. Salah is not debatable. It's not if you feel like doing or when you feel like doing. If you miss one or two, make up for it. But do your Salah. Uh, Juma is not, a, not something you can choose to go to or not go to. You must go. Friday is something you must go to. Get to Juma. It's very, very good to you. Uh, Zakat is not debatable. You must do it. Uh, Ramadan, not debatable. Uh, dua, pray every day, all the time. Never stop. 100 times a day, 300 times a day, 600 times a day. Pray whenever you can. Uh, reading of the Quran is not, a, not something that you decide to do only on Ramadan. It must be done throughout the year, all the time. Hajj, if you can do it, do it. Get to go do it. Must do it. And then Dawah is, again, very, very important. These are the things that are very important. Your foundations. These are your foundations. These are the things that you need to do. Dawah, please, 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 don't wait for the five or six guys that are going to do Dawah in your area. No, you are the Dai. Dai is not a, t a title that must be given to five or six people in the world. Dawah is given to every single human being. If you're a Muslim, the first thing you need to do is start telling people about Islam. There are differences of opinion on the subject, but I personally think the sooner you start telling people about Islam, the sooner you will strengthen your own faith in this belief. Now, the next point that we can move on to is first impressions. Now, I showed you in this already that the first impression of the Quran is Surah al fatiha when you read it, it tells you exactly who you are going to learn about. It tells you that you're going to learn about Allah Ta'ala. tells you exactly who you're going to learn about. So first impressions are lasting impressions. This first impression of the first opening chapter of the Quran is a lasting impression. It sits in your mind forever and you think, wow, this is what this book's about. Now what is your first impression when you see this clock? I have before me a little clock and uh, I hope the camera can, can pick it up properly. But you see that the hands are not moving on this clock. This clock is broken. It's not working properly. It's just staying in one position. It's one of what is called a bubble-eyed clock. And if I turn this clock around and I turn around the back, you'll see this is a conventional clock. It actually gets wound up. You wind it at the top here. So the top of the clock, you wind it. And there's the back. You can see all the parts that are supposed to move in this clock. And this clock, there's only a certain combination that will make this clock work. You can put maybe a motor car parts into the clock, and the clock won't work. You can take television parts and you can put it into the clock, and this clock won't work. You can be clever and take a sewing machine parts and put them into this clock, and the clock won't work. You know what will happen if you put sewing machine parts into a clock like this? It will neither give you the right time, nor will it sew your clothes. So the only way that this clock will work perfectly, this watch will only work perfectly, if the right parts are in the right place at the right time, and it's all fitting perfectly, all the cogs must work together perfectly. I can put parts from other pieces together and it will not work. Now, why would Islam be any different? You see, when we decide what parts of Islam we want to keep and what parts we don't want to keep, how do we even think that we are going to be able to have a religion that's going to work properly? You see, if I decide that I'm not going to do wudu properly, and I'm not going to do my salah properly, and I'm not going to uh, fast in the month of Ramadan properly, and I'm not going to pay my zakat properly, and I'm not going to read the Quran, and I'm not going to go on hajj, and I'm not going to do dawah, and we expect that our prayers are somehow going to get further than our hands. They are not going to go anywhere if all the parts are not working properly. 
We need to make sure that these parts are done working out properly and they're all working together perfectly. When all these parts work together properly, then our watch of life will work properly. So the first impression is we might look like a Muslim from the outside. We might have a topi on. We might have a gurta on. We might be at Salah, at mosque on, on Juma, but we are not practicing in our hearts. We are not a watch. We are not a sewing machine. We are nothing. All we are is a pretty face with no, hands that don't move and a second hand that doesn't move. But to everybody else, we look like Muslims. We need to have a look at the back. We need to look where other people can't see. And we need to look at the parts and see why aren't the parts working? What am I doing wrong? What do I need to change? You know, we wonder why our salah is not efficient, why our prayers are not going anywhere. It's because we haven't done any introspection. And I don't want to be hard and I don't want to be harsh and I don't want people to say, he's always saying negative things. But all I'm saying is we need to really look. We need to have a look deep inside ourselves and say, what am I actually made of? What makes me tick? Haven't we heard that expression? People say, what makes that person tick? What makes you tick? What makes you a Muslim? Other than what people see on the outside. What do you like in the darkness of your own home where nobody is there, where nobody sees? What do you like with your child? What do you like with your parents? What do you like with your wife when no one else sees? This is when we really see what a Muslim is. They say the first impression is a lasting impression. The impression you make on someone is the one that lasts for months. It takes a long time for people to change their opinion of you. So what is the first impression they get of you when they see you as a Muslim? Do they see someone who cheats in business? Do they see somebody who's a womanizer? Do they see someone who has double standards, who, who goes to clubs and parties and does all sorts of haram things and then suddenly on Friday he disappears off to mosque? No, no, no. We need to make sure our first impression is the lasting impression, that they see what... What we say on the outside, what we do on a Friday is the same we do throughout the week. So the next point that we need to get onto before we run out of time is, is the Quran guiding us or are we guiding the Quran? This is probably the most important point that I brought up so far. This is the book, the Holy Quran is the book that must guide us. We do not guide, the Quran guides us. What are we allowing our lives to be fooled by? Are we allowing our lives to be fooled by the popular media? by adverts. You know, I went shopping the other day and I bought some shirts. In India, I bought some really nice shirts. Now, for four shirts in India, uh, is the same price I'd buy one shirt in South Africa. So obviously, I went crazy and I bought a lot of clothing. And one of the things that was so nice about uh, these clothes is they've got no labels on them. None of them are designer things. They're all made by different people in India. And then people are very proud of making their own products in India. But the big problem is, when I bought these things, they put them into these packets. And the packets, or the packaging that it was in, we had these women, like half naked, and I had to walk down the street as a Muslim with these packets. Now, I cannot do that. You see, I cannot do that. Because if I'm following the Quran, I have to obey what the Quran says, and I cannot do that. I needed to change the packets. You see, one of the things we do is we try to justify. We say, well, I'm in another town, or I'm in another city, or I'm in that shop. I should... No, we can't. We must do what the Quran says. We can't change the Quran to suit us. So we can't guide the Quran. The Quran needs to guide us. We need to follow those teachings. And if it says that we can't do certain haram things, we can't do them. We can't compromise and go to somebody's wedding. And at that wedding, everybody's getting champagne. And you don't want to feel out, so you have a bit of champagne. And you only have one sip, just so it does, you don't look out. You cannot do it. You cannot try and justify that later and say it was for the better good, or some parts of the Quran this, or some parts of the Quran. No. You cannot change the Quran. You cannot put into the Quran. You need to do what is right. The final point that I'd like to bring up today is that go back and pray for you have not prayed. This is the scariest words that I have ever read in the Sunan is when somebody was told three times, go back and pray for you have not prayed. And he came back again and he said, go back and pray for you have not prayed. And the third time he went back and said, go back and pray for you have not prayed. And when he came back the next time, he asked the Prophet, وسلم, why did you tell me to go pray three times? What have I done wrong? Teach me. The exact thing is, teach me. And he told him to go back and he said, each time you're in your movement, each movement that you do, come to full, a full stop. So every movement comes to a stop. In other words, crisp, clean, slow movements. Make sure that you're doing what you do properly. Your salah shouldn't take you three and a half seconds. It should take you a while. So you must concentrate on your salah. You must concentrate on every single movement. Know why you're doing it. So make sure that you never have to go back and pray again. Make sure that you do everything with right motive, with right thinking. 
Love what you're doing. Islam is the most beautiful religion in the world. I know I have looked at other religions. I looked at Christianity. I looked at, at Krishna consciousness. I've been and looked, I've studied many religions in my life. But I can tell you what, the last seven years have been the most successful seven years of my life. And I would never, ever change Islam for anything. And uh, as long as Allah Ta'ala keeps me on this religion and keeps me safe and keeps me sound, I will serve Islam. So from me, Arib Islam, Assalamu Alaikum. hereafter will be measured by its proper use in the present. According to the glorious Quran, one of the best ways to use your money is to spend it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by spreading his message of Islam. Peace TV is a non-profit Islamic satellite television channel that is primarily dedicated for just that cause, the proper presentation of Islam. It's a great choice to invest in it and a golden opportunity to purify your wealth in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Support Peace TV. Send your zakat and donations to IRFI Al Ryan Bank, 47 Calthorpe Road, Birmingham, UK, B151TH. Pound account number 0113230. IBAN GB49ARAY 3000830113230. Sort code 300083. Swift BIC code ARAYGB. B22. Please confirm your contribution at support at peacetv.tv. Support Peace TV, the solution for humanity. <laughs> In every job that you do, you want to be the best that you can be. To be the best that you can be, you have to follow the example of the best that ever were. When it comes to Dawah, there is no better example than the example of those men whom Allah chose to do the best of jobs. His noble prophets and messengers. Join me, Muhammad Tim Humble, as we study together the methodology of the Prophet in Dawa. Rush to adopt the matchless qualities that make the procedure of Dawa extremely effective in the methodology of the prophets in Dava every Tuesday at 11 p.m. and repeat telecast at 12 p.m. UK on Peace TV.